اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس بی ود یو ٹوڈے وی ار اسٹڈینگ دا ویری لاسٹ سورہ اف دا قران سورہ نمبر 114 سورہ النا اینڈ ان اینی بک دا لاسٹ چیپٹر از ویری امپورٹنٹ بیکاز دیٹ از اے کنکلوڈنگ ریمارک اینڈ ان قران دا امپورٹنٹ اسپیکٹ از دیٹ دس کنکلوڈنگ ریمارک آلسو کمپلیٹس اے ہول سائیکل وچ سٹارٹڈ وتھ دا ویری فرسٹ سورہ وچ از سورہ الفاتحہ اور دا پریفیس اف the quran the opening chapter of the quran but there are six uh, controversies which we have to think of before we start the surah the first of all we discussed in surah al falak in very much detail that uh, one of the very renowned and reliable sahaba um, abdullah ibn mas'ud he was of the opinion that this surah and the surah before it the last two surahs of the quran are not part of the quran and they were just uh, prayers which were taught to the prophet by god via angel jibril and the rest of all the um, companions of the prophet believed that these are part of the Quran and we talked about it why that happened he had a misunderstanding and a misconception he never uh, had the need to clarify it with the prophet whereas other companions they had spoken to the prophet and the prophet had said that, said that these were parts of the Quran and at times people have used this incidence to cast doubt about the authenticity of the Quran and saying that there are parts of Quran which have been added but uh, when you do research and when you look at the general consensus you come to realize that these two surahs the last two surahs are part of the quran then there was also some controversy about whether uh, this surah was revealed in mecca or medina chronologically where does it belong and uh, the answer is that it was revealed to the prophet twice in mecca very first revelation and then again when the need arose in medina so it was uh, sent down by archangel jibril as a prayer for protection again and what was the protection against um, again we have detailed story very interesting story about a magician sorcerer lobed bin Awesome cast a spell on the prophet and Uh, surah al-falak and surah nas the 113th and 114th surah were sent to take the effects away of that out. interestingly the surah before it al-falak it talks about external factors uh, the harms which can come from outside to a human being and this surah the whole chapter is dedicated to the harms which can arise within the thought process of human being and uh, in surah al-falak uh, allah taala is mentioned once god is mentioned once and four evils are talked about whereas in surah nas allah is mentioned thrice and only one evil is mentioned and that evil is doubt created in the mind of a human being so this again stresses that the most important thing in life is not having any doubt and having a very clear view of and last but not the least a very interesting part is about the jinn what on earth is a jinn how do we reconcile the concept of jinn with the current day modern science and uh, again a uh, lot of criticism has been raised against islam and Quran it talks about uh, invisible beings invisible intelligent beings known as jinn um, and angels of course but the jinn are the bone of contention uh, among modern scholars and many of our muslim scholars from this century i've seen they themselves had some serious doubts about it and just to appease the modern scholars they have come up with many excuses and many ideas trying to explain the jinn and many of them say that they do not believe in jinn because it uh, sounds sounds like a very primitive concept and we'll talk about it uh, when we come to the ayah which mentions the jinn so let's start with the first ayah bismillahir rahmanir rahim ayah number 1 qul a'uzu bi rabbin nas say i seek refuge with the sustainer of human kind so four words are used here the first word is qul which means say the second word is a'uzu and uh, we have already discussed and we'll quickly go through it again that istaaza or a'uz is to seek protection but it's a special kind of protection generally protection is ijara Uh, but auz is a kind of protection when you cling for uh, dear life to someone so you are holding on to someone for dear life like a child clinging to a parent when he's in danger and you're not letting go of the person you are taking protection with and you're holding on to them and you are seeking protection against something which is invisible unseen and here it's uh, something very intellectual look into it in the last surah when we say qul auz bi rabbil falak that we see protection from the lord against unseen evil and the next one is min sharri ma khala from the evil of anything and everything that he has created so the question arises one point you are saying that it's an unseen evil and at the second point you are saying evil of anything that he has created so how do you rec- 
reconcile the two? And the answer is that we can see some evils and there are some evils we cannot see. So if you, something is very obvious, it's easy to protect yourself. So if you see a cobra snake uh, right in, in your path, you can avoid the snake and you can walk away or you can try to kill it or, and save yourself. But if it is hiding in the bushes and you step on it and you have not seen, the evil will become manifest later when it bites you. And by then, it is very late. And both of these surahs, Allah is saying that we should seek his protection from the evil of every creature that he's created before that evil harms us and before that evil becomes evident. So here again, the same concept is there. We are seeking refuge with the sustainer. So the word Rub, which is generally translated as as the Lord or the sustainer is actually a very comprehensive word and it has seven elements to it. So Rab is a Lord which has total control of you, full authority, who has the power to make you, to sustain you, to care for you, to provide for your growth and development and to protect you. So these seven qualities have to be present for having the title of Rab. So in general English you would say uh, Rab is the Lord, the maker, the cherisher, the sustainer, the carer, the provider of growth and development development and the protector and all of that is summed up by this one word with two letters in it rub and the last word of this ayah is nas which means uh, mankind or humankind commonly sometimes translated as people ayah number two is malikin nas which means the king or the sovereign of mankind ayah number three is ilahin nas which means the god of mankind so you see a beautiful transition here we start with the lord i mean there can be many lords um, a lord can have as little as one person under his com or her command. So even if you own one person, you are a lord. And then the transition goes up to king of mankind. A king has many subjects. And then from the king, the next step up is Ilahinnas, God. Because God has all the kings under him. So basically, lords have people under them, which could be as little as one. And kings have many lords under them, with many people under their control. And a god controls all the kings and all the lords and all the subjects of the lord. What Allah is telling us here is that for mankind he is the lord he is the king and he is the god and no one else we are not a slave to anyone else we are all free and we are all equal we have equal rights and we are all given duties by god and if there's any concept of a lord or a king and a god in the absolute term it is only and only for allah and no one else so now read again he is the only one who's the lord of people the only one who's the king of people the only one one who's the God of people because he's the only one who's created them. He is the only one who cares for them. He is the only one who owns them and he's the only one who provides for them. No one else can do that. But then we ask, what are we seeking all this protection again? And the answer comes in the fourth ayah. Min sharril waswasil khanna. A simple translation says from the evil of the whispering elusive tempter which creates more confusion than it explains. So let's go word by word. Min sharrin. From the evil of. Now Shar is the word used for evil, but shar is an evil which is very obvious. The word shar is very similar to sharara, which means a spark. So just like a spark is obvious and a spark of fire, when it flies in the air, you know wherever it's going to land, it's going to cause problem and you step back from it. Similarly, the evil which becomes very obvious and you know it's going to hurt you. So you're asking protection. But we said auz is a protection you ask about unseen things. So you are asking protection from this evil even before it is becoming manifest. So we are saying to God, King of men, Lord of men, God of men, protect me from the evil even before it becomes apparent and manifest to me. And what kind of evil is it? Al-waswas il khanna. In English language, we translate it as a whisper. But in Arabic language, it is not just a whisper. The general word in Arabic language for a whisper is hamasa. And hamasa could be a good whisper. Somebody could whisper a good news to you and say, congratulations, you've been elected the president of a country. Or it could be a bad whisper. Say, sorry, God bad news for you. So that would be a hamasa. But waswasa is the kind of whisper which is always bad. It's never good. So a bad whisper which creates doubts, which creates confusion and which brings bad news to you is a waswasa. And the word used here is waswas. Now if it was the whisperer, we would use the word mawaswis. And if it was the act of whispering to whisper, we would say viswas. But the word used here is waswas which is different from waswis or viswas. And this is a high 
hyperbolic form. It means someone who is whispering again and again and again continuously like an obsessive, compulsive, full-time professional whisperer. So it's his job. He is going to keep on coming and putting these ideas into your mind, giving you bad news, bad ideas, creating doubts in your heart. That person is known as Waswa. And to make it even more profound, Al Waswas is used here. The absolute really big time number one, number uno whisperer, which we all know is an attribute of the devil or the shaitan. And the last word of this ayah, Al Khanas, is giving us another characteristic of this whisperer. Khanis means someone who steps back. And Khanas means someone who keeps stepping back. But to keep stepping back, you have to move forward and back, forward and back. So this is a person who is on retreat and attack, retreat and attack. So he steps back, gives you space. And as soon as you're a bit calm, he steps forward, creates doubt in your heart again. And then steps back, gives you a little bit of time to reflect on it, see how you react, whether you are coming to terms with it or whether you're affected by it, and then attacks again. So this is a relentless activity of stepping back and stepping forward and retreating and coming back and attacking again and again. And next ayah describes where do these doubts go? Where are they created? Allazi yuwaswiso fi sudurin nas Who whispers in the chests of men. Um, many people have said it's the hearts of mankind or hearts of men. Not right. The word for heart is kalb and hearts is kalub, the plural form. Here Allah is using the word sudur, which means the chest, the thoracic cavity. Now what's in the chest? You've got a rib cage, you've got lungs and lungs have got air in it and then there's a heart in there. So what Allah is saying is that he doesn't go straight to your heart because a doubt is a peripheral thing. When you create doubt, you are just flirting with the peripheral thought process of a person. If you go straight to the center of your thinking process and try to alter that, that's not a doubt anymore. That's a confirmed thought or a delusion if it's not the right thought. But Allah says that this whisperer, he would bring doubt and just leave them around you. It leave a bit of a doubt in your mind and that would grow. Either you'll take it or you'll reject and it will grow and it will cast a big gloomy shadow on your thought process. And then Allah answers in the next ayah who this person is. Minal Whether they be from the jinn, the invisible being, or from mankind. So let's start with the jinn first. Now this is a very controversial topic and uh, as I said earlier, there have been many attempts to try and change the nature of a uh, discussion about the jinn. Uh, the modernists among the Muslims they're very embarrassed. They're apologetic. They're embarrassed about the concept of jinn. It's such a primitive thought. Having genies around you and genies in the world. It's like stories from Aladdin. And they try to reconcile with this concept uh, using the current scientific knowledge and they're trying to go on an appeasement policy, seeking approval of uh, the non-Muslims, especially the uh, scientific community. And they try to say, oh no, jinn means uh, people you've never seen before. Uh, jinn means um, maybe bacteria and viruses, microscopic organisms. It is not an entity. It's not an intellectual uh, being. It's not a different kind of a being. It is just a variation of mankind. But before we talk about the Islamic concept of jinn, which is very integral to uh, the concept of belief in God, and I'll explain to you why it is so integral, let's talk about jinn. The word jinn is a genius word. In fact, the word genius in English language comes from genie. In olden time, the concept was that every human being has a genie. And some human beings have these genies which come and help and they provide information to them from the unknown, from far away land and they bring them knowledge and people who had this knowledge which normal people did not have they were known as geniuses so even the modern English word genius comes from the old concept of having genies living with human beings invisible forces which can bring you news and information and knowledge in Christianity the concept was there as demons and the same concept of demons is found in Hinduism in Sikhism in Buddhism in almost every religion of the world in Judaism they even have a a particular name for it known as Shadim and the concept of Shadim is very similar to the concept of Jinn. So what I don't understand is why do we have to be on the defensive and why do we have to feel so guilty and embarrassed about a concept which is shared by the whole of mankind throughout history. Even the non-religious people today are using the word genius which is coming from genie and this is probably one concept on which all human races and societies and groups and anthropological 
philosophical subgroups of uh, human race agree upon. This is a very common concept and there must be some substance to it for it to be present there among each and every human society throughout history. Now let's come to the Arabic word jinn. The Arabic word jinn uh, is from the root word janna and janna means concealed, something which we cannot see. This is the same reason why um, a garden like the paradise garden, janna, is known as janna because the land is concealed by vegetation. When you have a lot of grass and trees and bushes growing on it, you cannot see the land at all. And that's why such a land which is covered, which is concealed by greenery is known as Jannah. And the early Mufassirin, the people who gave the explanation of the Quran, like uh, Johari and Rahe, they have said that Jinn means something, or Jinn and Jannah, both of them, they mean something which is concealed from human senses. And this is where it becomes a very important concept of Islam. When you read the start of the Quran, Allah says that people who believe are the ones who believe in the unseen. al ghaib This is a very strong uh, teaching of Islam that human beings, their abilities of perception are limited. So al ghaib is the realm of the unseen, something which is beyond the reach of human perception. And modern science has proven that. We cannot see colors below the red color spectrum. We call them infrared. We cannot see colors above the violet color spectrum. We call them ultraviolet. We cannot hear sounds below a certain threshold. We call them subsonic uh, wave. And we cannot hear sounds above a certain threshold and we call it ultrasound. Similarly, there are forms of energy we can see, uh, like radioactivity, the gamma rays, the beta rays, the alpha rays, they exist and they're very strong and very damaging, but we cannot see them. And Quran says that there are intelligent life forms which exist in the universe, but we cannot perceive them. Two of them have been explained to us, angels and genie, known as jinn. There might be more than these that we don't know of. For genies, Allah says that they have been created from fire and we know fire produces infrared heat which we cannot see. So anything which has been created out of a source of energy which we cannot perceive of would be invisible to us. And the basic teaching of Islam is that humans need to recognize their limitations. They have to know that there's more to this universe than what they can see. And Allah is the creator and sustainer of all of the world and all of the creations, most of which and many of which we cannot perceive. Be it microscopic organisms like bacteria and viruses or the dark matter in the space, which we say that 90% of the space or more than 90% consists of dark matter, which we cannot perceive and which we can see. Now, this last ayah, min al jinnati wa nas, it shows us the two sources of doubts which are created among the human beings. So, one source is the jinn, which is an invisible, intelligent being that we cannot see and perceive. But the second one is human. And among human beings, the whispering of doubts could be created either by the man himself, like you and me individually, we can have doubts in our heart created de novo from our own mind or it could be from someone outside and how do we counter that so let's look at quran in other places especially when it comes to the jinn and shaitan and the evil and the demons who create doubts in our heart how to combat with that so in surah al-araf which is the seventh surah ayah number 200 and surah hamim which is the 41st surah ayah number 36 both of them they have almost the same ayah which says that if you are tempted by shaitan satan then seek refuge with allah surely he is the all hearing all knowing the words used here are Fasa'iz billah innahu samiyun alim And the very next ayah in Surah Al-Araf 201 It says Indeed when Satan whispers to those mindful of Allah And those mindful of Allah are described here as Inna ladhina taqku They remember their Lord Then they start to see things clearly Fa'iza hum mubsirun And this is a very interesting concept So Allah says Whenever a doubt is created Temptation is created in your heart What you need to do is Seek refuge with Allah So you turn the the tables on the devil. The devil is trying to take you away from God. In martial arts uh, there is a form known as judo and in judo what you do is use the force of your opponent to bring him down. So if somebody is pushing you you pull them and if somebody is pulling you you push them. So you are using your force in combination with their force to bring them down. And that is the technique Allah is teaching you about shaitan. Every time shaitan comes to you and he creates a doubt it's very frustrating because he does it again and again and again. Waswas il khannaz. Tax and retreat attracts and retreat. How do you make it your power? Allah doesn't say just defend yourself. He doesn't say just put a shield there. No, he says like the judo style martial art, you take that force of shaitan, combine your force with it and move it in the direction you want to bring him down. And how would you achieve that? He wants you to have doubts about the religion and be away from God. And every time he does that, you realize it and you seek refuge with God. So the more he tries to take you away from God, the more he tries to create doubts and worries in your heart, the more you remember God and he he becomes frustrated.
frustrated because his mission is to take you away from God and by creating doubt and whispering worries in your heart he is in fact getting you closer to God and that's what Allah says فَإِذَا هُمْ مُبْسِرُونَ and people who are the righteous people they start to see things very clearly whenever shaitan wants to create doubt in their heart and how would we achieve that the same way we learn to play judo and other martial arts practice doing it again and again and ayah number 35 in Hamim Allah Ta'ala has described it وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ سَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا زَوَازٍ عَظِيمٍ but this cannot be attained except by those who are patient in adversity and who are truly fortunate and sabr the word sabr in Arabic is not just patience it's persistence it's perseverance so when you persevere in adversity when you stick there don't give up then you get this quality and then you learn this skill and then you are the truly fortunate because every time sometime someone is trying to break down your confidence someone is trying to bring you down you actually bring them down so you turn your weakness into your strength and you turn all your weaknesses into your strength. the second part of the doubt the waswas the whispering comes from humans themselves now easy to identify other people creating doubts in your heart and in your mind humans have the capacity and the capability of doubting themselves creating automatic negative thought and in surah kaf which is the 50th surah of the quran in ayah number 10 allah has described that and allah ta'ala says wala qad khalaqna al-insana uh, indeed it is we who have created human being wa na'lamu ma tawaswisu bihi nafsuhu and we fully know what their innermost self whispers to them wa nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min hablin wari for we are closer to them than their jugular vein and uh, the prophet in his juma khutbah used to say nauz billahi min shurur anfusina i see protection of allah from the evil of my own self and that is probably one of the most difficult things to acknowledge to understand and combat and the method to deal with it is the same as it is for the method to deal with the devil with shaitan martial art judo star make your weakness your friend. every time you doubt yourself you stand up to yourself and say i seek protection with allah and i know this doubt is wrong and even if this doubt is there my god will protect me and turn my weakness into my strength and this gives you such a strong connection with god for example there's a doubt in your heart i won't be able to wake up early in the morning to pray my morning prayer solution seek protection with allah pray to allah oh my god i am about to sleep and i have this serious doubt it's very late in the night i won't be able to wake up in the morning pray my morning prayer i leave it with you i leave myself in your protection and i pray to you to make it happen and then go to a peaceful sleep without sulking about another time you have a temptation in your heart about anything people can be tempted by drugs they could be tempted by money they could be tempted by anger as soon as a temptation comes in your heart make it your strength connect to allah say allah i seek your protection from this thought which has come into my heart help me to overcome it and protect me from its evil and don't leave it the message from surah al falak and surah al nas is don't leave it for later immediately ask protection auz is the protection you seek before the evil appears it's the protection from the unseen so allah is saying preempt it do it before if you can what we tend to do is we have big plans i'm going to do take a nice shower long shower then i'm going to dress up nicely and i'll catch a flight and i'll go to makkah and i'll go to kaaba and i'll stand in the center of kaaba next to the wall and touch the wall and then i'm going to ask for allah's protection and then i'm going to ask allah to help don't leave it allah is closer than your jugular vein wa nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min hablin warid he's right there you don't have to go to the mosque for that you don't have to wait for the next prayer time you don't have to wait for evolution and you don't have to wait to go to makkah allah says i'm closer to you than your jugular vein right there and then at the time make your connection with allah and that my friends is the concluding remark of the quran when the quran started with surah al fatiha it talked about installing and establishing faith by creating a connection between humans and allah and when quran is completed and you come to the last surahs it is talking about demolishing and dismantling doubt by creating a connection a direct connection between humans and allah may allah give us a true understanding of the message and succeed us in this life and the hereafter amin so amin the references used for this study session to go back from the very original ones from al tabari from the 9th century al kashaf by the makhshari uh, tafsir al kabir al qurtubi then the middle age ones where is uh, tafsir ibn kathir uh, ruh al maani by muhammad alusi and then muhammad picked all the translation of the quran more recent one tahim al quran by modudi muhammad asad very good translation of the quran you might not agree with see but a very good translation and then the more recent ones like the one from al azhar university and some of the muslim pakistani scholars the dictionary is consulted
consulted. Two of the main dictionaries are consulted for the study, Lisan al-Arab, which is from the 13th century, and uh, Taj al-Arus bin Jawair al-Kamus, which is more recent, 18th century-ish. Not very recent, but still recent enough. A special thank you for everyone who made this effort possible, especially our IT team. Last but not the least, a big thank you and special prayers for the person who started this dawah effort with me, but prefers to stay anonymous at present. Please remember us all in your prayers. May Allah reward everyone who's involved in this dawah effort, especially the people who are watching it and listening to it. May Allah reward them in this life and the hereafter. Amin. Amin.